And Esther knocked on the door, the solid wood hard against her small knuckles. When no one answered, she knocked again. This time the door flew open, and we faced a young man, 17 or 18, broad-shouldered, his skin dark like the night. He looked down upon us with a detached anger, as if our presence offended him, and his chiseled face reminded me of an ebony mask I had once seen in a history textbook. Who's come calling, Daniel? The voice said from inside. Although I could not see his sister Rose, I recognized her voice, soft and melodic, and, in its own way, cultured. Every other colored woman and man I knew talked in that particular southern colloquial dialect so prevalent among their race, but not Sister Rose. She sounded more white than most white people, although I would never have said it to her face. And it didn't sound as if she was putting on airs. Her words and voice were unforced and natural. When the young man failed to respond right away, Sister Rose said, Well, your manners, invite our guests inside. The young man stepped aside, and we entered. The smell of boiled collard greens permeated the one-room house. In a far corner, a wash basin full of soapy water and plates rested on the kitchen table, and the young man's sleeves were rolled up past his elbows. Beads of water and soap suds clung to his forearms. Sister Rose sat with her back to a window, and in her lap she clutched an open book so old and weathered that the pages had yellowed and curled. A brown water stain discolored the top, and the cardboard jacket hung loose from the binding. When she saw us, she laid the book on the floor next to her rocker, allowing me to see the title, Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. To her right were two shelves, nothing more than wood planks supported by old bricks, which held an additional fifteen or twenty books more than I had seen in any one place except the schoolhouse. As far as I knew, nobody in town except my teacher, Miss Pilgrim, owned so many books, and I couldn't remember seeing another adult reading anything other than the Bible. My uncle was unusual in the fact that every day he read the newspaper from cover to cover, yet here was a colored woman reading a novel, and who possessed her own private library. A few townspeople owned copies of Ben-Hur, but I never heard one person say he or she had actually read it. Sister Rose stood, a tall woman who held herself erect, proud. Why, if it isn't Miss Esther. She didn't offer her hand or approach Aunt Esther. That would have been too forward. She was the aristocrat of Boonesville, if such a thing were possible. But in the white world, she was only one more colored woman, nothing more. And Esther crossed the room and extended her hand. I expect you know my boy, Davy, and Esther said. Sister Rose took my aunt's hand as she appraised me with her dark eyes. I hear tell your boy is a scholar. I didn't know how to respond, feeling that if I agreed I would be bragging. If I denied it, I would be lying. As a result, I kept my mouth shut. Sister Rose said, My boy studies some himself, don't you, Daniel? Some, Daniel said, his voice the deepest bass I ever heard, a voice made for singing, a poetry. Many times I had seen him around twin forks, a book sticking from his overalls, although I figured it was a way of shoving it in our faces and saying, I got a book and can read better than you. He had a book in his pocket now, the spine showing the first word of the title, Puddinhead. What could I do for you, Miss Esther? Sister Rose asked. As I'm sure you heard, my man has come home. He's doing poorly, really poorly. I need someone to look after him while I run the store. I hear you're good at helping those that are suffering. Sister Rose stiffened. I know what people in town say. They say I'm a witch, that I have magic cures. I'm no witch, Miss Esther. I know a few herbs. A few roots that can help those in pain, but I'm no witch. Never meant no such thing, Aunt Esther said. I need you to sit with him, look after his needs. Davy does what he can, and he would like to do more. But I won't have his study suffering, so I need help. 
I can pay 50 cents a week. I know it ain't much. That's a really generous offer, Sister Rose said. And you'll do it. I'll bring my boy around, too. You wouldn't mind, would you, Daniel? Whatever you need, Mama, the young man said. Would you like us to come with you today, asked Sister Rose. We could walk back with you right now. We were unprepared for such kindness, and then Esther was taken aback. Tears gathered in the corners of her eyes, but she pushed her lips together and willed herself not to shed them. She took a moment to find her voice. <clears throat> Maybe you could bring along some of those potions if you think they might help, Marsh, she said. Sister Rose kneeled before a cabinet, opening the bottom drawer, where a number of bottles of all sizes and shapes sat in perfectly aligned rows. She took three of them, studying each first, before she placed them in a brown cloth bag. She stood and passed the bag to her son, who tied the top into a knot and wound it around his waist. We can go now, Miss Esther, if you're ready, she said. We walked the two miles back to town, and Esther and Sister Rose leading, Daniel and I following ten or twelve paces back, so we didn't catch their dust. The boy kept a hostile silence, and I wondered if he were mad because his mother had asked him to accompany us. He was a head taller than I, and I had to look up to see his sculptured expression, the kind that would cause the people of Twin Forks to call him uppity. Whatever his attitude, it made me uncomfortable. In an effort to break the tension, I pointed to the book in his back pocket. I've read Puddinghead Wilson. So, my teacher, Miss Pilgrim, had loaned me the book, and I recall the fierce rush with which I devoured the novel in two consecutive nights. Because I loved it so, I wanted to talk about it with someone other than Miss Pilgrim, and all I got from my troubles was so. Right then, I figured he had never read the novel, that as I suspected, he wore the book for show. Good book, I said. That's all. I was tempted to say more, to tell him to go to hell, but instead I fumed all the way into town. Uppity was a good word for him, I thought. <laughs>